So what is Ricean fading? Well, here's the formula for the probability density function, and it looks like Rayleigh fading with an extra term and this modified Bessel function. And the modified Bessel function here is a function that increases as uh, um, x increases, if this is i naught of x, uh, and it looks like this. So for bigger values of r and s, uh, this function here is going to increase. Of course, for bigger values of r and s, this function here decreases, and this one increases. So this function, as we increase r, is a combination of increasing functions and decreasing functions. And overall, we'll get a function that increases and then decreases. And uh, we'll see that uh, as we go through here. Um, Here's the physical scenario uh, where you've got a base station or a transmitter, any transmitter transmitting, where paths are reflecting off uh, things, objects, buildings, for example. Uh, and this is exactly the case as in Rayleigh fading. And if you'd like to know more about Rayleigh fading, check out the video in the link below. Uh, and uh, in this is, I've drawn the Rayleigh fading example here. Lots of paths all bouncing off lots of objects coming in with roughly similar amplitudes. In the Ricean case, there's one difference, and that is that there's a dominant path. And often it's a line of sight, a direct line of sight that doesn't bounce off uh, any buildings and doesn't have any energy absorbed by those reflections. So if you've got a dominant path, then you've got a situation with the dominant path plus Rayleigh components, and that's what Ricean fading is. Now let me try and draw that uh, in terms of the phase diagram and uh, including this probability density function here. So if I draw in the plane here, I try to draw a three-dimensional uh, picture here. Uh, and in the plane uh, here we've got the real and imaginary components of the phases. So this is the, the r and the theta. And then I'm going to draw the probability uh, on the vertical. So let's just look in the plane to start with. Uh, in this case, we've got a dominant path, the line of sight. So the amplitude of this is going to be much stronger than the others. So its amplitude and phase in the phasor plane is going to be quite strong. Uh, so here I've drawn this one here. Uh, and in comparison to the others, where, where we're getting all the other components from the other paths, they're going to be smaller in comparison to the dominant one. Uh, but they all, of course, have their own amplitudes and phases and different directions because they've all undergone different uh, phase transitions and absorptions as they reflected. And this gives us a resultant overall path, uh, which is uh, in, in the phasor domain. So again, it's exactly the case as with Rayleigh, except in this case, one of the paths dominates. It could be more than one, but uh, let's just consider one dominating. So what's going to be the difference here? Well, in this case, we've got, uh, if we define this term s, and if s squared equals m1 squared plus m2 squared, and if m1 and m2 are the mean values of two Gaussians, one in the real direction and one in the imaginary direction on the phasor plane, then exactly as in the case for Rayleigh fading, we're going to have a two-dimensional Gaussian shape in terms of the probability density. Only this time, that shape is going to sit over the place uh, given by this S, which is from the mean of the Gaussian in real and the mean of the Gaussian in imaginary. So it's going to sit over the top of this dominant path. Okay, so the dominant path here, if we go up into probability space, there's now going to be a Gaussian distribution uh, in terms of probability sitting in the real direction and in the imaginary direction, just as it was for Rayleigh, uh, over, over that point there, over the dominant path. And so if you can, you can see here, I think, that if you set M, if M1 equals, uh, equals M2 equals zero, then we have exactly the Rayleigh case. So Ricean includes the Rayleigh case when M1 and M2 equals zero. And if you look back at the video for the Rayleigh case, you'll see this Gaussian exactly centered over the origin. And the only difference here is with Ricean is it's shifted now to this place which is over the location of the dominant path. 
okay? So this is, uh, this is now uh, the situation with ricin, and we have Rayleigh as a special case. What are some other things with ricin? Well, sometimes we're interested in the, uh, the uh, rice factor, or sometimes called the rice K factor, uh, and this is a uh, factor, uh, and this is a representation of the power that's in the line of sight path, uh, S squared, divided by the power that's in the reflected paths, which is two sigma squared. And again, you can look back to the Rayleigh case to see that that is the power in all of the Rayleigh components. Okay, so this is the Rice K factor, and clearly uh, if M1 and M2 are big, so if the dominant path is strong, then the Rice K factor is large. And this gives us an indication of the dominant path in comparison to the reflected paths. Another thing to think about is the phase, and this is sometimes confusing to people with Ricean fading. If I try and draw this picture here, uh, now I'm going to draw it vertically looking straight down on top of this picture here. Uh, then I'm just going to draw here, so this is the real and the imaginary, and this again, just to remind you, these are the phases of the received, each of the received signal is going to come in with an amplitude and a phase. And we're going to draw it on this diagram here, amplitude and phase, which we can of course draw with real and imaginary with a change of variables to Cartesian. Okay, so in this case, the one that I've drawn here, this was the amplitude and phase of the dominant line of sight path here. And then I'm going to draw these other ones, which uh, if I just look down on the top of this diagram here, um, I'm seeing these changes here, uh, trying to match it up. Um, and we've got this resultant waveform here, uh, this resultant amplitude and phase here. So this was the dominant path, and these were all the others. I mean, of course, in reality, they're just electromagnetic waves. The only thing that distinguishes them is their amplitude. In this case, they've, they've all got amplitudes and phases, it's just that one has an amplitude that's bigger than all the rest, significantly bigger. Okay, so in this case, uh, it looks, so this, the, the Gaussian um, mountain here, if we're looking down on the top, is now centered on this dominant path. So if I drew a sort of a circle around here of equal probability, maybe a contour line around this uh, Gaussian shape here, and I'm looking down on the top of it now, there's that contour line. And so what we can see is if this was the dominant amplitude and phase, then there would be equal probability of getting amplitudes on this circle here. Now let's look back, if M1 and M2 equals zero, we get Rayleigh, so that's what we're more familiar with. I'll draw that curve here, so this is the case if it was Rayleigh. Now clearly, and we're very used to, I think, and familiar with, comfortable with the fact that in Rayleigh fading, the phase is uniformly distributed. So the phase here, it's equally likely to get any phase, this circle centered on the origin, it's equally likely to get any phase uh, for Rayleigh fading. Again, they're all equal or very similar uh, um, in magnitude, uh, not equal, but similar in magnitude. And so the chance that you can, it's, it's possible that, that when you move slightly and you change the relative frequency, uh, relative phases and amplitudes of all of the different components, that you could go from one side of this phase or diagram to the other, because they're all gonna add up and slight changes in your location can mean significant changes in the resultant phase. Uh, this is not the case for ricin because ricin is dominated by the main line of sight path, dominant path. And so in this case, yes, you can move from here to quickly to over here and quickly to over there with small changes in your location, but you're not, the, the dominant path is going to change its amplitude and phase much more slowly because the dominant path is simply a path where you're only changing the phase and amplitude by moving physically further away from or closer to the receiver. So if you change the path length along here, and this dominant one, it doesn't have contributing components to cancel it out because they're much smaller uh, in magnitude. And so I think you can see that this phasor will change. So if you move your location, if you move further away, then you will have more of the waveform, more of, um, wavelengths between you and the transmitter, and so therefore your phase will change. And so as you, if you move vertically, uh, uh, so if you move exactly away in the exact direction of the line of sight uh, to the transmitter, if you move exactly away or exactly towards, then you're gonna be moving around, this point here will be moving around uh, in a circle. If you're moving exactly, uh, oh sorry, it will be moving in a circle, and of course it will also be changing its amplitude, so it'll be getting smaller or bigger. But those changes are very small in comparison to, like the movement of this 
movement away or towards is very small in comparison to the changes that you're getting from all the other components adding up. But I think this gives you an indication that you're going to have two essential modes, a slow fading mode and a fast fading mode. So this amplitude here will rotate around, the center of this circle will rotate around as you move uh, further away and it will also uh, go out and come in depending on whether you're moving further away and, and once you go through another, if you move towards and then you go the distance of a wavelength then you will have gone all the way around the circle and you will have come back uh, and if you're moving towards you'll come back closer because the amplitude will be higher as you move towards and so on and so if you move exactly towards or exactly away you'll be moving this, this main location here, the center of this Gaussian hump uh, around on this phasor diagram. So in total it is true that in for overall all of the phases will be equally likely because you don't know exactly what the distance is that you are away uh, and therefore you will be it, at, in, over time and moving around here in a random way you will be uh, moving all around this phasor diagram. So the phase will also be uniformly distributed for ricium. But if you stand in, in one location and you only move a small bits around that location, then the phase will tend to stay, uh, all these phases will tend to stay uh, close to the dominant path and the dominant path won't change very much. So this is the difference between ricium and Rayleigh, is really the dominant path and the effect that that dominant path has on the PDF uh, of, your, uh, of your amplitude, but also the phase distribution. I might just finally draw some examples of the PDFs for different values of uh, S. And so for S equals uh, um, zero, of course, we get exactly the Rayleigh curve. This is R and this is PR of R. Uh, this is S equals zero. And as S equals bigger values, it spreads out. So this is S equals four, for example, S equals 2. And so this is the effect of having your the mean value of your dominant path being further away or closer means that you have different uh, curves here of your uh, Ricean distribution for amplitude. And as I said, the phase over all time is uniform uh, in, in all directions, equally likely in all directions. Um, but, the, uh, but if you are staying still and, and just moving small distances around, then it will be that the phase is located around that dominant value of that line of part site if that's not changing. So that's the important things from a practical point of view for Ricean fading. So if you found this video helpful, please like the video. It helps others to find it. Uh, subscribe to the channel for more videos. And of course, uh, check out the webpage for a complete categorized list.